for the live button. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us today um, for our presentation. Uh, we've, we're joined by David Good, uh, who's a member of 2018 of the Explorers Club. Uh, uh, he is a PhD student in biology at the University of Guelph, author, filmmaker, and founder of The Good Project. His research focuses on characterizing um, gut microbiota of remote and isolated Yanomami communities still living in a traditional lifestyle of hunting, gathering, and gardening. Um, he and the Good Project team conduct experiments uh, in that Terry to support programs in health, research, education, and cultural preservation. His unique ancestry and scientific training provide a rare opportunity to explore and advance our understanding um, when building global, global awareness on the importance of protecting these very few remaining remote and isolated indigenous societies. Through his personal journey and scientific endeavors, David's presentation will take us today into the world of the Yanomami and catch a glimpse of life in the Amazon rainforest. Um, David, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Robin, and, um, and a pleasure and honor to meet the Canadian chapter here. Um, as you know, I just recently moved to Canada, uh, to Guelph, Ontario, and, and I love it and looking forward to, you know, learning more about, um, you know, that area, especially in Toronto. So thank you for having me. Um, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. <clears throat> OK. Uh, so my talk um, today, I'm going to share a slideshow presentation on the Yanomama people um, who are a remote indigenous uh, uh, um, population that lives in the upper Orinoco region of southern Venezuela and in northern Brazil. And uh, they live in the Amazon rainforest and they have been popularized in the last decades as being one of the last remaining indigenous societies with limited to no contact with the outsiders and to have retained a traditional um, uh, uh, lifestyle um, that has uh, largely remained intact for, for, for millennia. So here in this opening slide is a uh, aerial shot of a typical Yanomama Shabano, which is uh, a Yanomama term for village. And um, as you can see here, there's a thatch roof and there's a communal uh, um, area in the middle. And actually, if, if you could bear with me for a second, let me go ahead and set up my, um, my laser pointer. There we go. So right here is the communal opening. And then within the communal, uh, in this uh, Shabano, there can be anywhere between 50 to 250 on average uh, residents living in the village. So if I could go in um, to the next slide, you'll see sort of a, um, here's a picture of Venezuela here so for reference. And the Yanomami territory is in, in this upper Nor Orinoco region right here. And then on the left here, you can see in light green, the demarcation of Yanomami territory, um, which is not a political demarcation, but it is a recognized uh, biosphere by the UN known as the Casiquiari Alto Orinoco Biosphere. And in within Amazonia, it's one of the largest, um, you know, per, for, for an indigenous population uh, per capita, one of the, you know, one of the largest preserved areas for any indigenous group. Um, so to kind of uh, give you context and background on how I came to study the Yanomama and my research at Guelph, um, uh, there's a bit of a backstory. And I guess I could say my backstory uh, begins with uh, my father and my mother. So here um, is a, a, on the right here, a picture of my father, Kenneth Good, who is an American anthropologist. And he was uh, studying for his PhD at Penn State University under the late uh, Napoleon Shagnon. And uh, within that time, there was a, a kind of a, an argument within the socio-anthropological realm over why the Yanomami engage in warfare. And on one side, you had sort of this one group arguing that the Yanomami uh, engaged in warfare because if they were to kill, they would get more wives. And therefore, if they had more wives, they would have more children, thereby increasing their reproductive fitness. Uh, and then the other sort of uh, opposing camp was that it's more than just, you know, a biological innate propensity uh, for these um, uh, indigenous groups to go to war. And there must be other influences and other factors, maybe strategic re resources and so on. So my dad, as an anthropologist, was kind of caught between the two. 
And he went down to the Amazon to measure protein intake and to see if protein, uh, a high quality protein, such as uh, game, you know, hunting over uh, a game like monkeys, capybaras, tapers, and so on, had any influence over Yanomami patterns, Yanomami mobility, and uh, intervillage conflicts and warfare. And so my father, as an American anthropologist, when he went down to the Yanomami, he, he found it difficult to, to acquire empirical data, measure protein intake, and to be able to extrapolate from that information to come up with an explanation as to why the Yanomami behave that way without getting into the psyche and, the, and, and under really understanding what's going on in the mind of a Yanomama. So he decided that in order to, to really do his work well, he had to learn their language. And then when he started learning their language, he became absolutely enamored with their culture and their society. Um, and to give you sort of a context, you know, the Yanomama, uh, they, they don't count beyond two. They have a um, counting of one, two, and many, no written language. Um, they have uh, their, uh, no advanced technology. You know, during that time, it was um, the bow and arrow and the stone, stone axe and stone um, tools. Uh, of course, today they have changed because there's been introduction of steel goods like machetes and pots and pans. And everything that they need is extrapolated or is extracted from the surrounding rainforest. So my father coming from Philadelphia really, you know, was <laughs> experienced culture shock, but really found a way of life that really resonated with him. And one thing that really resonated with him is that the Yanomama people, um, they lived in harmony with each other in the rainforest for thousands of years. And they, um, you know, they don't have this sort of uh, um, this, 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 this burden of Western stress where they have to be concerned over who's, what's your identity? What are you going to be? You know, how are you going to pay the bills? And, and what, what, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, what are my chances for upper mobility and status and so on? And for my father, it was very relieving. And so what was supposed to be a 15 month research program in Amazon ended up being a span of 12 years in the jungle with the Yanomama people. And during those 12 years, he moved in with them and became one of them and hunted with them. And of course, uh, during those 12 years, uh, a woman named Yadima uh, met my father and really like took a liking to him and they fell in love and got married. And of course, this woman is my mother. And here, uh, pictured here is Yadima. Um, and Yadima means windy because she was born on a windy day. And here you could see she's got the down feathers in her hair and the macaw feathers in her uh, shoulder and the flowers in her ear. And, um, and so over the, the span of 12 years, they, they got married. And of course, um, according to Yanomami customs, and I, I have to say that because, you know, when we think of marriage as not sort of this big grand celebration in Yanomama culture, you, when you take your hammock and because they sleep in hammocks and you tie it next to your spouse and that, that seals the deal, that's a marriage. Um, and then of course, if you want to divorce your husband or your wife, you untie your hammock and you move it somewhere else. So very, very simple compared to our Western, Western culture. And, and of course, you know, they wanted to start a Yanomami American family. Um, and uh, and uh, they started with me and I have a younger brother and younger sister. And here's a picture of me here down below. And this is my mother holding my sister. Uh, on the upper right here is me hitching a ride with mom. And uh, so for the first five years of my life, I lived as, uh, as a Yanomami uh, uh, traversing between the worlds of the jungle in Amazonia and the uh, suburbs of Rutherford, New Jersey. And I love this picture here because, you know, the Yanomami women are, are amazing. You know, she's, she's holding two kids while trekking through the jungles barefoot and without any clothes. And, and you know, and, and here, you know, I have soft baby feet. If I go, you know, 20 feet without any slippers on, I start getting, start getting cuts on my feet. So, but, um, and then, you know, growing up, I have these memories of living in the jungle. Here is my bow and arrow learning how to shoot a bow and arrow with my, with my fellow, fellow uh, relatives here. Um, and then of course, uh, just as much as my father showed my mother, uh, just as much as my mother showed my father her world, he wanted to show uh, her his. So he brought her to uh, New Jersey and she is the first person of that community to ever leave that area and to experience the outside world. So for her, it was a huge culture shock is she had really no frame of reference in terms of seeing an airplane for the first time, electricity, a beach, an ocean. 
And so for Yarima, my mother, it was quite a culture shock, but she adapted, you know, she liked going to these uh, um, festivals and these, um, here's a carousel here. She loved the beach and there's a picture of us here at the Jersey Shore. And here's a picture of uh, mom with that 1980s. This is her first hair perm. So, you know, I'm sure she has no idea that this woman is an indigenous Amazonian uh, being in America for the first time, but um, she adapted and there, she had a lot of happy memories. But unfortunately, um, being here in the, in the United States uh, and a, so far away from the Amazon and cut off from her culture and her society, she grew very lonely and, um, and was very frustrated over the fact that you know, she couldn't speak to anyone else in the world. No one else spoke Yanomami except her husband. And she couldn't call upon her sisters to go crabbing. She couldn't, you know, she couldn't, she was very estranged. And, and so after about five years, um, she made a very uh, difficult choice to separate from uh, the family. And that would be the last time I would see my mother for 20 years. Um, so I invite you to, if you want to learn more about my father's research and his experience uh, living among the Yanomami in the 70s and 80s, I invite you to read his book, Into the Heart. Um, and if you want to learn a little bit more about what it was like for me as a five-year-old losing my mother and not growing up without a mom for 20 years and struggling with my identity as a as an indigenous person, um, I invite you to read uh, The Way Around. But uh, after these two books, if we were to fast forward 20 years, I had come to terms with my indigenous uh, identity and I had come to terms over why my mother had to leave um, because she just really, you know, put it plainly, just couldn't make it here. And, and, and she was, she was back home in her world and her, in, 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 in the jungles. And, and I came to appreciate that. But when I graduated college in 24, in 20, I'm sorry, 2014, I decided that I had to go on a quest on a journey back to the Amazon rainforest to find my mother, to see if she was still alive. And, you know, they, my mother lives in a community so far away, so remote, there's no way to contact her or call her or find out where she is. So I simply just had to go to Venezuela. Um, I met up with uh, my colleague, Hortensia Caballero, and together we decided to take a trip deep back into the Orinoco region to find her. And uh, so here's a, a great shot of us going up the Orinoco River and in, in the Amazon. And on the upper right here is uh, me on the river in 2011. And I was, as I was going up the Orinoco, I remembered, you know, everything, the foliage, the, the, the sounds of the parrots, the flock of parrots flying by, the, the, the temperature, the water, even the sting of the mosquito. And all those memories started flooding back to me when I was a kid. And of course, um, one of the major uh, uh, obstacles, barriers for us to uh, get past at the Guajaripa Rapids. And this is a, um, you know, in history has been a very infamous set of rapids that have, you know, prevented a lot of explorers from getting further up the up Orinoco River. And this in part explains why the Yanomama had remained so isolated for so long. Um, and uh, let's see if, uh, and so, the difficult part about these rapids is that uh, you have these strong currents and hydraulics and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the channels meander around these large boulders. Um, and the problem is, is that we have these long boats and if you were to broadside the boat too much within the current, you would risk capsizing. And when you capsize in the middle of the Amazon, <laughs> you're, you're gonna be stranded for a very long time. But uh, this was monumental for me because uh, my father capsized here once while he was sick with malaria in the 80s. And uh, so I'm always respectful of this um, barrier. But with, with the, my fellow Yanomami guides and our team, we were able to cross the rapids safely. And uh, about, and about a few more hours going up the Orinoco River, we arrived at the trailhead that leads to the community that my mother was from, known as Hasapuwe. And uh, with an outboard motor, the community members can see who's coming. So they all rush to the, to the riverside to see who's coming. And when I had announced to them that it was me, uh, uh, David, son of Yarima, you know, and we had asked if uh, my mo uh, mother was home, they got really excited. And they had uh, sent someone out into the, into the forest to retrieve her because she was out collecting plantains. So in the meantime, I had set up my hammock. And when I was there, I was immediately mobbed by the Yanomama. They, 
had their hands down my pants, up my shirt. They were, they, you know, pulling my nose, touching my ear. <laughs> and uh, because for them, you know, uh, it, it's quite a phenomenon to see a member of their community who is Yanomama, but to have been to have born and raised in the world of the Naba, the world of the outsiders. And here's a, um, a short, whoop, let me go back here. So you could see, you could see, you know, this, this little girl was touching my beard for about 20 minutes because they don't have beards. And for her, it was quite a phenomenon. And for me, it was very surreal because I'm not just a, an outsider, you know, a researcher, scientist, or anthropologist, whatever, looking at these people as subjects of research. But when I look at them and their faces, they are also my family, my cousins and my aunts and nieces. Well, after about an hour and a half, um, my uh, uh, my mother walks into the village and it was immediately quiet and I w got out of my hammock and I walked towards her and she walked towards me and I couldn't couldn't speak any Yanomama. She couldn't speak any English. So but all I could do is put my hand on her shoulder and I said, you know, mom, it's me, your son, David, and I'm I'm finally home. And here's a picture of uh, the, the moment that I reunited with my mother in 2011. And there in 2011, I realized that it really didn't matter, you know, for me to find uh, why she left, you know, why, why did she leave me as a child? Why did she abandon me? Because that's how I internalized it. All that matters is that she was alive and she was well. And I was about to embark on this great, great new adventure in rediscovering my Yanomami heritage and starting this great relationship with my mom, a mom that I didn't have for two decades. And then I, uh, uh, so since 2011, I've, carried out seven expeditions to the Amazon rainforest. And during each expedition, I learned a little bit more about my Yanomami heritage, my Yanomami um, uh, 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 way of life and how to talk and, and hunt and, and trek. Oops, sorry, let me go back here. And of course, I was christened with a Yanomami name. Uh, of course, David is a, an American name. And uh, uh, soon my uncle came up to me and said, and had given me my Yanomami name. So I'd like to, to share that moment with you. So that was in 2011, and at the time I didn't speak any Yanomami. Um, uh, there was only uh, two phrases that I remembered from my childhood. Uh, one was uh, ya ohi, which is I'm really hungry, and the other is ya bossi shiiti, which is my butt really itches. So at that time, those were the only two phrases I was working off of. So meeting my uncle for the first time, I had no idea what he was saying. But looking back on it now, he was telling me that I am his nephew. He is my uncle. This is the truth. This is the truth. You are from this village. And he christened me with my Yanomami name, which is Anyopoa. So I am known as Anyopoa uh, within my tribe. So, of course, you know, uh, uh, I just kind of dug right in, you know, I was part of the family and I wanted to learn everything about my Yanomami heritage and from, from, from getting to know the kids in the village, uh, the Yanomami chew tobacco, as you could see here, and this woman is chew tobacco, the men chew tobacco, and <laughs> here, here I am trying tobacco for the first time. Um, and uh, there's another silly selfie with one of the women in the village, you could see here, they're wearing the uh, heat -e sticks and where they pierce the lower lips and they often pierce the nasal septum as a as means of self-adornment. And of course, I wanted to try some of the eats of the rainforest. And here's my mother presenting me with a segment of a bow constrictor. And uh, I learned how to climb trees, how to wield a machete and collect certain fruits and nuts and berries. Um, I learned you know, how to adorn a, um, a, uh, a monkey uh, tail as a headdress here. And, um, and I really enjoyed life in the Amazon. And I truly came to understand this, this way of life where the Yanomami 
um, really don't experience uh, a lot of the stressors of the Western world. You know, they don't experience, you know, loneliness or, or depression. They don't even have a word for suicide and everything they do, they do communally as a family, as a unit. Um, and, and they live a life based on reciprocity. Um, and of course I was given my, given a bow and arrow. So I went back, back to practicing my archery skills. Um, I learned how to take the hallucinogenic yopo, which allowed me to contact the spirit world uh, within Yanomami cosmology. Um, the, the mother loves painting my face, you know, so every time I go down there, I always have a different kind of design on my face. And um, just for reference, uh, the uh, pigments from the Anato seed here um, on their lower right. I learned how to uh, forage for mushrooms and trek through the rainforest and um, and really and, and how to harvest honey. And um, and it's just amazing how, you know, being Yanomama, how there's this great food security and it's a, and more than just a security of food. It's just a security of happiness in life and 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 um, and being able to subsist uh, in a way that uh, does not destroy the rainforest. It doesn't in a way that protects the rainforest, in fact. Um, here's a tobacco garden. Uh, so they cultivate tobacco and they chew tobacco every day. And, um, and of course, one of their main uh, cultivates, um, cultigens that they, that they grow here is in their gardens is the uh, plantain right here. And I, um, I mean, the list can go on and on, but I generally show a few of the things that we eat in the Amazon from anteater to caiman um, to freshwater crabs, plantains, giant armadillo on the lower right. Here's um, a capybara um, and there's a taper. Uh, sorry, the piranhas kind of got a, a hold of this one. Termites and then um, uh, these black uh, tarantulas, which are actually pretty good. Um, I learned how to cut down trees, how to harvest uh, uh, firewood and the Yanomami women are amazingly, amazingly strong. I mean, I don't even think I could carry that basket of firewood. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Life in the jungle is simple, but it, it is hard. It is hard. And of course, to every beginning, there's an end. And I realized that as a Yanomama born and raised in the, in the Western society, educated in the Western society, I've come to understand that, you know, the Amazon rainforest uh, is under attack. You know, um, I am fortunate that my family and their village in the Amazon is very remote and very isolated, though, you know, it is very hard to visit mom, but I also very grateful that they live in a very pristine forest. But if you look on the map and surrounding their territory, you see an invasion of gold miners, you see deforestation, you see, you know, spreads of novel diseases like measles, tuberculosis, and, you know, nowadays COVID-19, unfortunately. Um, and so I realized that, you know, with my Western education, I needed to, you know, create some kind of program or some kind of um, support base to be able to um, help, you know, the existing Yanomami programs protect the Amazon rainforest and their culture. So that's why when I returned, I founded this organization known as The Good Project. And The Good Project is, is really a, a multidisciplinary team from anthropologists to MDs to microbiologists. And together we come up with uh, projects that help support programs in the Amazon among the Yanomami that support their um, healthcare programs, their culture preservation. Um, and we also um, work with their intercultural bilingual schools. And, and as of late, you know, which ties into my research, advancing uh, um, uh, scientific research on, the, on, the, uh, on their microbiome. And uh, oops, this is a, a slide that may be a little out of place, but I wanted to show you, as you can see here, there's the territory in the lower left, and this is sort of the water route that we took within um, uh, the Amazon rainforest. So Wanapue is my village here. But one thing I wanted to point out is that the Yanomami of the 60s and 70s of my father's time have changed quite a bit in the last half century. You know, there's been um, a lot of engagement with political functionaries and uh, there's been, um, you know, a lot of uh, um, change and influence from missionaries. And so there, today you see this sort of gradient of urbanizations where you have Yanomami communities like on the upper right, in my, such as mine, that still live this traditional uh, way of life of hunting, gathering and such system through small-scale horticulture. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are Yanomami that have migrated to uh, the urban cities like Puerto Ayacucho. And with 
and then everything in between. And with each of these changes comes various challenges and conflicts with not only with their socio-political engagement and their identity of who they are as a Yanomami, as a Venezuelan citizen, and who they are as a Yanomami in the Amazon rainforest as an indigenous person. Um, and they have to deal with uh, various conflicts such as um, you know new diseases and, and, and um, as well as various political and economic policies that affect their area. So that's why um, there are certain programs uh, uh, within uh, certain points in the Amazon territory, especially those that have high uh, contact with outsiders. There's these uh, intercultural programs that that try to to teach the Yanomami, you know, uh, why it is important to protect the Amazon, to teach them how to read and write in their native language, also in Spanish, and to sort of give them the skills to be able to um, engage with the nation state in the outside world um, with agency and self-determination um, to, to be empowered, to be able to represent themselves, um, you know, on the world stage. And here's another uh, uh, school here. And of course, you know, we support uh, various health programs um, dealing uh, um, with the Yanomami um, introduced diseases. So anywhere from delivering mosquito nets to running medical programs and supporting existing uh, programs at the, uh, the medical bases in the Upper Orinoco. And uh, to tie into the last uh, subject part of our res uh, my presentation is the, um, the scientific research. So in 2018, um, I was working with the great Maria Gloria, um, who is a world-renowned scientist in, um, uh, in studying the microbiome. And she had conducted an expedition in 2014 in a different area of the Amazon territory and had um, measured their human microbiome. And so the microbiome is a collection of all the microbes that live in and on your body. And it's not just uh, that they're living there, but they're interacting with your host, with your mammalian cells that are engaging with your immune system. Uh, and they're there from, from, the very, from, from, from the first day that you're born. And um, so what's interesting about the Yanomami microbiome uh, after this study was reported is that they have one of the most diverse microbiomes ever recorded in uh, any uh, human group. So what does that mean to us, to Westerners and outsiders? Well, you know, through the advent of antibiotics, extreme sanitation practices, sedentary lifestyles, and uh, uh, exposure to industrial toxins and pollutants and so on, we've lost a major part of our ancestral microbiome. And because of that reduction in microbial diversity and its, and its consequence, we now are experiencing extremely high rates of chronic inflammatory diseases from, from diabetes, obesity, to um, IBD, uh, Crohn's disease, MS, the list just goes on and on. None of these diseases are, uh, exist in Yanomami society. And science and research is starting to show that you know, these microbes you know, play a very, very important role for conferring health benefits to the Yanomami people and helping them um, not contract, you know, these uh, inflammatory diseases. Well, not contract, but be, you know, to to they help maintain their bodies in a way so that they keep the bad pathogens in check and basically keep a good state of uh, homeostasis, balance, and biodiversity. So what I did um, in 2018, 2019 was to conduct a um, research expedition to measure the microbiome of the Yanomami people. And fortunately, being Yanomami, I have very unique access to this group uh, because I am not just collecting, um, well, the subjects of my research are my very own family, my mother, my cousins, my brother. Um, here, <laughs> here's a picture of my mom. I'm, I'm taking a uh, blood glucose here. So she wasn't too happy about that. but. Um, what was interesting is that, you know, for me, not only have I rediscovered my Yanomami heritage, but I'm now kind of engaging in the scientific exploration to look at the very unique and rare opportunity, um, uh, the microbiome of a remote indigenous society. And perhaps, you know, it could help answer and close the knowledge gap on, you know, what are we missing in our society? What bacteria did we destroy in our society that's exist that's within a Yanomami society that could help us? And of course, for me, it goes a step further. Um, I don't just want to study the microbiome, you know, I, and uh, I want to use this as another layer in the, in the call to protect the Amazon. So we're trying to 
create, you know, uh, a system where we can protect the upper Orinoco region um, because they are a, the Amazon's a biodiversity hotspot. But the Yanomami people, they themselves as organisms, as these super organisms are, are biodiversity hotspots. So there's much we can learn. And throughout my expedition, I, I sampled my, um, myself to measure my own microbiome to see how that modulated as a Western Westerner uh, to that of a Yanomama. And uh, I'll give you a brief overview because um, I know we're running out of time, but um, these are some of the main body sites, you know, in terms of looking at the microbiome, anywhere from, 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 the, from your feet to your elbows, to your forehead. And of course, I took fecal samples. Um, and uh, what I wanted to show here is some of the preliminary data, but instead of going deep into the data, I just wanna show you a picture, a story, right? So if you were to look here in red, this is healthy skin. And um, what you see in dark red is high abundance, right? And then when you see purple or light blue, that's low abundance. So this healthy skin cohort taken from the Human Microbiome Project, um, uh, the HMP project, this is what a typical healthy skin microbiome looks like. And this is the heat, heat map. Now, if you were to look at the Yanomami on the bottom row, look at the diversity, look at the different colors. Now, this the story that it's showing here is that they have a much higher presence and diversity abundance of microbes compared that compared to the healthy skin. So here's here herein lies the question: well, you know, what does healthy look like? How can we say someone is healthy when we don't even really have a baseline of what a healthy microbiome looks like? And if you look at the Yanomami, they've never been exposed to antibiotics. You know, they don't, they don't, um, you know, have very active lifestyles, very diverse diet and intimate engagement with the environment. And so this is what we're studying for the first time. Um, let me uh, show you here. This is a diversity chart. Again, it's kind of showing the same picture, but in a different way. Here's a healthy skin right here uh, from Human Microbiome Project. And then here's the Yanomami. So uh, as you could see from, from, from a, a diversity standpoint of view, they are much higher than that of a typical Westerner. And then these bars here show my microbiome as a modulator from that of a typical Western US subject to that of the Yanomami. And I never quite get to the Yanomami, but right around here at this time point, I did contract uh, malaria. I had a co-infection of um, falciparum and Vivax, and I did take some anti-malarial pills because when my fever had hit 105, I realized I was in a, in a bad spot. So I definitely decided to take some, some medication uh, before my malaria infection got any worse. Um, I'll, if you would like to connect with me offline to talk a little bit more about my research, I'd be happy to discuss with you. I would like to end this presentation by saying that uh, I am going on an expedition this August. And this August, we are looking to achieve certain goals like uh, advanced um, research on the Yanomami gut microbiome. And we're going to um, also install SATCOM's uh, communication systems completely powered by solar to help mobilize medical teams um, and also to uh, um, increase the administrative capacity of these schools. And then lastly, to deliver a fully electric outboard motor uh, so that we can decrease dependency on fossil fuels in that region um, and, uh, and so that they are able to travel, um, you know, medical teams and, and schools are able to travel to and from that area without relying on gasoline. Uh, on this last note, um, as an epilogue, uh, in 2020, uh, my fulfilled uh, a wish that my mother had given me uh, in 2013. And my mother told me that she really missed French fries. She really wanted pizza. She really wanted apples and she really wanted peaches. Those are the four things that she told me <laughs> in English. And she said, you take me there. So it took me about seven years, but seven years later, I just, I was able to fulfill my mother's wish to take her back to the United States so that she could reunite with um, her uh, children, my brother and my sister, and and my father, and in 2020 we were we were we accomplished that mission, um, and she did yes, and she did get her French fries. She, she was very very happy about that, and so we had filmed that process, and we are in the uh, in the um, we are producing a documentary no, uh, titled Why You Me. It's in post production, and we hope to uh, get distribution later this year. So keep your keep your eyes out for for a film for a documentary.
Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me. Um, I went from, you know, I, I, I am really grateful and, and proud to be Yanomama. And I am grateful that I had this opportunity as a, be, as a member of my community uh, that has been born and raised in Western society. And I'm really, really honored to be part of uh, University of Guelph. Um, oh, sorry, uh, University of Guelph, Ontario, where I will continue my research as a PhD student and characterizing the Yanomami gut microbiome so that we can better understand what it, uh, our health and our, and our interaction with microbes. And so that I can be in a position to also protect the Amazon and my family. So I'll leave it there. Um, here is my uh, contact information if you'd like to connect and I'll take it back to you. I'll stop share here and I'll leave it open. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was incredible. I'm sure that there are a fair amount. Lee's got her camera on now. Um, <laughs> I feel like there's definitely some of us who have some questions. Uh, who's going to put their hand up first? Absolutely fascinating uh, story. Really enjoyed that. Um, question I had was when your father first visited the village, had they had contact prior to that? Was, you know, what was the the scene back then yeah so um in the in the 60s 70s there um as a really they were originally from the uh, uh parima highlands and they were migrating towards the orinoco river and one of the reasons why is because the uh, missionaries had made sustained contact in 1950 mm -hmm. and when they learned about these missionaries and they brought steel goods like axes and pots and pans of course they started coming down um, my father, uh, in that particular region, um, he was one of the first Naba. Naba is a term for outsider to reach that area. So, in fact, when my ma mother had met my dad, she had never seen she had never seen a non Yanomami before. <laughs> and uh, my dad used to tell me stories where um, they didn't know what to make of him. They thought he was a spirit that had descended from 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 the skies, and they and they had questioned whether or not, as a spirit, if he was immortal. So he had overheard a conversation where they were determining whether or not should they shoot him with arrows? Because they were kind of wondering, like, is he immortal? Well, let's figure out. Let's let's shoot him a few times and see what happens. But he was able to tell them, like, no, 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 no. I, I will be very angry if you shoot me with arrows. But he did make first contact with a lot of communities in that region. Yeah. That's yeah, absolutely fascinating. Really, thank, thank you. Thank you. David had a question. Yes, thanks. Hi, uh, hi, David. Uh, this that was a that was magnificent, man. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Galbraith. I am at Royal Botanical Gardens in Hamilton, Ontario. So I'm about uh, forty minutes south of Guelph, and okay. I've got two very specific questions. Uh, first of all, who are you working with at Guelph? Uh, I, uh, my um, uh, research uh, director is uh, Emma Allen Burko um, in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology. Okay. Uh, she also she also has a company running New Biota. Um, um, but, uh, her, uh, but I'm in, I'm in that department. I'm working on in her lab. Okay. Uh, just wondering, I'll, I'll shoot you an email message later just to say hi, because I've got sure. connections with some of the work that's going on, uh, <laughs> with, uh, folks at Guelph involved in indigenous communities and biodiversity conservation. Oh, and, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'd love to help you connect up with that. Um, you're, you're mentioning the, the, commercial applications just now and so on also made me wonder from the slide that you presented of a headline that said was it bonanza or some, <laughs> something about about yeah, that yeah I, i'm really wondering about the um what kinds of arrangements that have been made about access and benefit sharing arrangements and how the whole question about uh uh commercial potential of biodiversity how you're how you're approaching that because you're in such a fantastically unique position of being yes. in the community and that's such a huge issue for everyone to understand absolutely in fact um uh there's a book that recently came out called inflamed which i highly recommend but um which talks about you know the inequities and biopiracy and parachute science right you know scientists coming in and leaving but um Obviously, I'm in a unique position where I would never do that to my family um, and, you know, especially to my own mom. So at its core, one thing I do have to say that this is a family project. So I don't I can't represent other Yanomami communities on the behalf of the entire tribe. 
Um, however, I feel that, you know, if any value were to come from this research, there needs to be a system in place where we have benefit share that can go back to the communities. And of course, I have the nonprofit to help, you know, facilitate that as sort of a conduit for that. So I, I do have a collaboration with um, a biotech company uh, based out of, you know, California um, that brings a lot of support to the Good Project and to the Yanomami people. So right now we're just, you know, we're just doing research, we're doing R&D, but, you know, if there's potential uh, to develop, let's say, a nutraceutical or develop any skin products or develop anything, you know, that we learned that's informed by the research done by the microbiome on the Yanomami, that uh, there is a system in place where there's a kickback, a benefit share to the Yanomami. Um, how's, the, how's the Brazilian government been on that? Um, so I don't know much about Brazil because my, my community is on the Venezuelan side. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Even so, so even so, and nobody... Nobody at the government level seems to quite get benefit sharing. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to talk more about that offline. You know, Venezuela yeah. is a signatory of the Nagoya Protocol. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are some some difficulties, you know, right now, given the political atmosphere um, in Venezuela. Um, but fortunately, you know, um, all I can say is that, you know, working with my family as a family project and also um, as a Yano Mami, I always have rights to return to my to visit my family and my bloodline has been there long before there was ever a Venezuela before there's ever a Brazil so um, and I do have the um, I do work with the indigenous leaders it's not just me I do speak with a lot of the Yanomami and listen to them and I consider them part of the team as well um, oh that's brilliant well uh, I'll, I'll connect love to chat later I don't want to hog the the screen here but thank you so much David it's brilliant stuff yeah I look for, I look forward to, to your yes thank you Anyone else? I have so many questions, but I feel like they're all in your book. So I feel like I need to, I need to pick that up and read it. <laughs> yeah, no problem. If you want to shoot one out now, that's, that's fine. <laughs> I'm also going to write you an email too, but I'm, I'm curious about the film that, um, that you're working on. Sure. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 We, we were able to, um, yeah, document the last expedition and, and my mother's, my mother's, you know, return. And it was a very hard one. If you think about it, you know, I'm trying to extract someone from the Amazon rainforest and probably one of the most difficult countries to, to, you know, and try to get her to immigrate into one of the most difficult countries to get into because she, you know, she's my mom, but she, I had to get the whole visa process and everything. So, so but uh, yeah, but she got, she ate lots of French fries. I could tell you that much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and imagine how difficult it was even just getting her a passport i yes very difficult <laughs> yeah yeah um at the time you know there was um limited um passports available because of there's sort of um economic you know there's some shortages right they even had shortages of paper so they had limited uh, capabilities to, to print passports yeah so uh so, even a birth certificate right so uh i had to make up a whole new birthday i forget what birthday i gave her you know <laughs> and it was really funny because at the time when she had to sign like she never she didn't know how to sign so she didn't know what to do so basically her signature on the passport is uh does not know how to sign that's her signature <laughs> and does your family understand um, your research project? And that, that kind of goes back like, to, yeah, that um, David's point about, you know, doing uh, research and that, you know, the ethics behind doing research is with indigenous communities. And, um, and it's, it's difficult. It's part of one of the um, uh, ethical conundrums that we're in, right? Because what is informed consent? Um, you know, how do you do informed consent with a community that doesn't count beyond two? Um, had, doesn't know how to read and write, you know, a non-literate society, you know, not that I'm, you know, and they're very, you know, very, very smart, right? I'm not saying anything about, you know, um, you know, their intelligence, but it's just the fact of the matter is, is that how do you explain um, data, right? How do you explain genetic material? How do you explain benefit share? How do you explain informed consent and so on? So that is a, um, a, an issue that we're dealing with and my family's understanding and I do the best that I can, but it's an ongoing thing. So I don't have all the answers. And I guess that's, that's one of the difficult parts about you know, doing things for the first time is that you don't know if you're doing it right or wrong, but you just got to do it. And you do it with a good heart and good intent, but you just make sure that 
um, you know, that you're open to, to, to putting yourself out there on the chopping block, which I am, because I believe, you know, this type of collaboration is critical for bringing resources to the Amazon to help, to help, you know, protect it and preserve it. So how, how did you uh, actually explain uh, terms such as genetic research and so on? Um, so we, we, I tried to explain in the context of their language. So, you know, uh, genetic research, obviously, uh, when, so we do what's called a, you know, a community gets together and we all kind of speak and we talk and the headman speaks. And, um, and I, what I tried to explain for the first time is that there's these little, little animals, little you know, we call them, I, there's no Yanomami word for it, right? So we just say bacteria in Spanish, but these little entities that live on you, but they're also a big part of, you know, um, keeping you safe and keeping you healthy. But obviously that is a huge, opening up a huge Pandora box, right? Because they live a life based on animism and shamanism. So basically to ex tell them that you may feel well or unwell based on, you know, the genetic interactions of the micros in your host cells is a little little difficult, you know? Um, so w we haven't really come up with a great way. And I'm looking to other leaders like Keolu Fox out of uh, UCSD um, and other, other um, you know, organizations like Variant Bio, you can look them up too and how they do benefit sharing with indigenous communities. But I don't know of any kind of benefit sharing when it comes to, to doing microbiome research that involves the communities like the Yanomami. So, um, it's 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 an ongoing process. I wanted to ask if uh, I was confused by the fact that when you uh, gave your talk, I thought you were said you'd been born down there, and yet your bio at the end said that you were born in Pennsylvania, and so I was just confused about that. I wanted to oh. My other question is whether you've taken your father back to uh, down there and, you know, obviously there's a complicated relationship for all these people. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry for, for that. Uh, I, I'll clarify. I was um, born uh, when my mother came to the United States um, uh, in 1986, uh, two weeks after she arrived. That's when I was born. Uh, so I was born in Bryn Mawr, uh, Philadelphia. Um, my sister was born down there uh, and my brother was born in New Jersey. Um, so I'll, uh, yeah, I was, I was born up here. Um, uh, and then my father has not returned since uh, uh, 1992 when, when, when my mother um, had decided to separate from the family. Um, so uh, however, in 2006, 16, I did bring a satellite phone with me and I was able to connect, you know, with my father from my village. And it was quite a, a unique and very interesting experience for the people of that community to connect with my father. And my father knew the language. It just came right back out, you know, and um, so unfortunately he hasn't been able to make the return trip. Yeah. And how long did it take you to learn the language? Oh, I'm still learning. I know more than those two phrases now. I can tell you that much. But yeah, um, yeah. No, what's what's great is um, is that you know, Shagnon, the anthropologist that made the Yanomami famous, had made a statement that if he didn't bring trade goods into the community, he never would have been accepted. Right, and of course, my father had to earn his acceptance and eventually was became part of the Yanomami. One thing I didn't realize is having Yanomami blood is that I'm only I'm, I'm automatically plugged into their complicated kinship network. So, you know, um, even though I didn't speak Yanomami and even though I looked weird with a beard and, you know, wearing clothes, I, I was part of their culture, their lineage. Um, and because I'm part of their lineage, um, I, through their, through their customs and through their practices, I was given a Yanomami wife and I had no idea I had a wife this whole time. <laughs> and, um, and I was really confused. And I said, okay, you know, for me as a Westerner, as American, I'm saying, all right, mom, you know, I haven't seen you in 20 years. Can we like 
can we can we slow down a little bit because I'm not ready to get married but um but what I learned you know through that experience is the kinship network and and they really you know treated me as one of them and and that allowed me to be in a very safe place to learn the language so I feel like you know learning the language is very comes very easy to me and also when I was five years old you're speaking to your mother and I was speaking Yanomami so I think it's you know probably somewhere in my brain um but uh, I can't learn it up here, unfortunately, very well. So I look forward to spending more time in my next trip down there to, to get a better command of the language. And how is the uh, society organized? It's a patriarchal, matriarchal combination of both. So the genealogy, yeah, it's patriarchal society. Um, very rather strict, gen, you know, gender roles. Um, and uh, uh, usually, you know, the men are the ones that are that contact the spirits and go hunting and, and you know, the, the women, you know, work the gardens and uh, they go crabbing. Um, but, you know, for me, in my experience, me, either one of these activities, <laughs> you know, one of them, e either one is very complicated and every, even either one's very difficult. I mean, um, you know, collecting firewood and, and cutting down trees and so on. Um, but when you look at the, you know, how they trace their genealogy, it is based on, um, you know, a patriarchal um, uh, lineage. Yeah. David, are, mm -hmm. you, you shared a story with me a while back um, about a school field trip. Are you comfortable with sharing that that story with the with uh, with everyone else? Because it's just outstanding, in my opinion, if, if, if you don't mind. Oh, oh, you mean in New York? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, that, that part's in my, yeah, in my book. Um, so when I, when, when my mother married my dad and, and, and they both, and then my dad moved here to the United States, it was, it kind of hit the, um, you know, kind of the international media. And so, you know, my dad had m movie deals and so on, like, you know, Richard Gere and Alan Alda were going to play my dad in a, in a movie. And, um, and then, and then, um, uh, you know, being, uh, uh, we were um, part of this sort of project in the American Museum of Natural History, where there's a South American, uh, 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 South American hall, right? And I remember, uh, I think I was in like third or fourth grade, and um, I was going through this identity crisis because uh, I didn't want to be Yanomami because I felt like, you know, my connection to my Yanomami identity is through my mother, but my mother abandoned me when I was five. So I decided, you know what, I, I don't want to have anything to do with Yanomami. Just want to be a good old American boy, play baseball, be, have a paper route, do good in school and all those things. So I, I created, you know, this sort of uh, new identity for myself. But then when I went on a school field trip to the American Museum of Natural History, and I walked down to the South American section, I looked up and there's a big picture of my mother on display, <laughs> on exhibit for all the world to see. And I just stood, you know, in horror as I saw all my classmates, like looking at my mother. And because, you know, my mother has sticks in her noses and it sticks in her nose and her lips. And I was so embarrassed because all of my friends' moms, you know, picked us up to soccer practice and made us peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I was so scared that my, you know, people were going to find out that my mom's this naked indigenous person eating spiders in the jungle. So, I mean, as a young kid, as, a, as like a 10 year old, you know, yeah, that's like the biggest fear. And I remember just, you know, running away and hiding in a corner somewhere. Yeah. And, and she's still there. So if you want to visit my mom, she's in the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And yeah, you can get give her a hello <laughs> wow that that's amazing yeah i was gonna ask about like you mentioned having an identity credit crisis and just forming your own story and did you grow up thinking you wanted to go back down there that you wanted to go look for your mom or at what point in your life did you sort of decide that's what you were going to do yeah so you know when 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 mom's um when we separated as a family, I didn't, it wasn't like this definitive moment, like, Hey, mom's never coming back. It was just, you know, when I was five and then when I turned six and seven, eight, and I realized that my mom is just like not in the picture anymore. And I realized she's not coming back. Um, but at the same time, I um, felt like uh, as a five and six year old that like, there was something about me that wasn't good enough for her, you know, for her to, to stay and be with her children. Um, and so, uh, I went through all my teen years, just absolutely renouncing my heritage. I didn't speak anything of, of my mother or, or anything about my identity. 
And it wasn't until I was like 21, 2021, where um, I was able to, for the first time, surround myself with the right kinds of people to really make me feel comfortable and safe and talking about my past and my history. And of course, when I came to sort of this uh, place in my life where I was able to forgive her, um, and, and not that she needed my forgiveness, but it was more for myself and my healing process. And then I realized, wow, I just spent two decades like rejecting my mom. And, you know, now I feel like I need to go find her. And I was just really grateful that she was even alive, you know, so. And I did that able to find her when I was 24. Yeah. Hey, David, I've got a question on YouTube. Travis is tuning in. Uh, and <laughs> Travis, first, he's saying great talk. But he also wants to know, would you expect other Indigenous groups, microbiomes, what would you expect them to look like? How many variation, how much variation mm. do you think there'd be around the world in indigenous microbiomes? Great question. So there would be um, uh, certain patterns that we would see, you know, uh, uh, among indigenous groups. And I'm assuming indigenous groups that still live kind of, um, you know, hunted gathering or have, you know, ha have a diet and lifestyle, not exactly the same, but similar, right? So a diet high in fiber, right? Um, compared to that of a Western diet, which is high in fats and protein and, 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 and simple carbohydrates where an indigenous diet may be high in, high in resistant starches, high in diet and, and um, I'm sorry, high in resistant starches and high in fiber uh, with not a lot of, you know, intake of, of, of fat and protein. Uh, relatively speaking. So I would say, you know, comparing those micro microbiomes that they all have a relatively similar microbiome, you know, with different different ratios of certain bacteria, you know, for example, you know, Prevotella bacteria, which are, you know, ferment fermenters, right, they, they ferment complex carbohydrates, um, versus other kinds of bacteria that tend to, for, you know, uh, break down simple carbohydrates. Um, and so, uh, uh, while the, at the strain level, bacteria level, they may not be exactly identical, but what's interesting is that you don't need to have exactly the same bacteria to have the same benefits because there's redundancy. There's, you can have different strains of bacteria or different species of bacteria that uh, live in different communities, but yet can confer the same health benefit because they produce similar biomolecules or they also help regulate the inflammatory response in similar ways. Um, now the question, from what my research and my reading is that one of the biggest changes is of the of a microbiome is antibiotics. So antibiotics is just like a nuclear bomb for your entire you know gut microbiota. So indigenous communities that have even had some exposure to antibiotics uh, um, have some kind of reduction in biodiversity. Can I just and ask one more question about your family? Have you talked to your father about, it seems like such a dramatic, wild thing to do, to expect to be able to bring this woman from the Amazon back to New Jersey in 1980 or whatever it was. Have you talked to him about how yeah. you thought about that? Absolutely. You know, my father knows the Yanomami of a very special time long before there was any kind of, you know, uh, um, major changes within the population. Um, I think during that time in the 80s and 90s, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever had a chance to visit Venezuela. Those are relatively stable democracy, you know, and really stable economy. In fact, it was, you know, uh, one of the one of the best economies in Latin America. So for my father during that time period, he had really had no issues accessing resources and so on. And it was really hard to explain to my dad that when I go to Caracas, you know, um, we only get water, you know, twice a day for a half hour, you know, in the, in the capital city, um, you know, there's, lim there's shortage of toilet paper, you know, things like that. So daily life has become very, very hard for a typical Venezuelan. So if, if, if daily life is very hard, you can only imagine you know, how encumbered or how hamstrung the, the system for, for, for doing passports and identification has become. So, um, you know, my father can't really relate to that, but he can relate to the struggles of getting through the jungles, like, you know, getting malaria and, um, you know, dealing with issues with the Yanomami people and, and so on. So um, I do have some great conversations with him and, and we do connect in a lot in, in, those, in those ways, yeah. <laughs> And I don't think nowadays, because my mom was, you know, 
I don't think nowadays you're allowed to board a plane when you're that pregnant. <laughs> so, you know, I was born two weeks after she had flown into the United States. And were you, was, was she wearing those things in her, in her <laughs> face as you were born in an American hospital? She did not wear those. No, you know, it's funny. It's she, she might have been one of the first Yanomami, if not one of the very few Yanomami to have given birth in a hospital. So the whole process was very weird, very strange, very, very, you know, alienating. And one time, um, uh, well, while she was giving birth, she was in labor. Um, I, I, you know, she was just a few centimeters dilated and then you know after a while she, she or a very short period of time she said she was going to give birth and and the doctors didn't believe her they said there's no way she could have dilated that quickly and ready to give birth but she just started she got out of the bed and she squatted in the corner at the hospital was ready to give birth to me right in the in the in the hospital room in the in the corner somewhere and the doctors and nurses were getting nervous and they convinced her to, to get back on the bed and and the doctor was like wow she's ready to give birth you know and and that and that kind of you know puts into perspective, you know, of the birthing process, you know, among the Yanomami compared to Western societies where our labor times on average is, are very, very long. And, you know, the Yanomami women, when she's ready to give birth, sometimes, you know, she'll just say, okay, I'm going to go take a trip out to the garden, goes out to the garden, gives birth, and then, you know, comes back with a baby. And then the next day is, you know, working the gardens, you know, collecting firewood. So, um, you know, and this is, I'm not, this is not my area of expertise, but that is one big cultural difference I've, I've recognized between, you know, Western societies and indigenous societies. Yeah. Are those sort of stories going to be in your film? Um, so the film Wayumi is a, my personal journey in, in going down and bringing my mother and reuniting her with my, my family. Uh, the next film project that I have in mind, um, and we're looking for partners, so if any anyone idea, is a Yanomami microbiome project. You know, the 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 the, the science behind studying them and their culture and their you know, and why it's important to study their microbiota and why it's so unique. Yeah. I think Haley had a question. Uh, yeah. So. Bit of a logistics question. How has COVID changed how your project operates or has it at all? Uh, I haven't. So my last, I returned March 2020, which I think is when the world shut down, right? Basically. <laughs> yeah, I remember. So I haven't returned since then. Um, and um, and since then, it took a while for the vaccinations to really get through Venezuela so right now, everyone on the expedition team is vaccinated. Um, and logistically, it's, it's all the same. It's just having those measures in place to make sure we're vaccinated. We have the PCR tests and having those, you know, rapid antigen tests um, and having sort of a, um, a, a isolation protocol. But once, you, once you're deep in the jungle, then, you know, it comes to, I'm sure as fellow explorers know, there comes to a certain point where you're just you're in the deep, right? And you just got to make do with what you have. And, you know, um, but every step of the way, we do have COVID-19 protocols to ensure that, you know, that, you know, we have negative tests. And, and we're just hoping that, you know, that everyone is healthy and safe. And of course, if any one of our team members is positive for COVID, then they would have to stay back, including myself. <laughs> How large is a uh, typical village? So the villages, um, yeah, if you look at, you know, sort of the typical ethnographic work of and demographic work of like John Peters, who's he, John Peters is a Canadian demographer. I think is one of the best, you know, demographic um, demographers of that area. So anywhere from 50 to 250. And so the Yanomami, obviously when the population gets to, larger and larger, it's not like they build a second story, you know, house on their Shavano, you know, the population density increases. And then when the population density increases, it leaves more opportunity for conflict, right? So, you know, less access to food and maybe somebody steals somebody else's plantains or somebody's bothering somebody and, and it can all ultimately end up in, in a fight, 
you know, which could be anywhere from a chest pounding duel to a club duel or to, uh, um, you know, sort of this, um, you know, kind of fight where they decide that the, they have to undergo a village fission. So the village will split up. So one lineage will stay and then another lineage will go to another part of the jungle and create a new one. And at that point, you know, they're much smaller. Um, so some of the very large villages can be two to three hundred. Um, my village, Itokai Teddy, which I identify myself with, is roughly around 75, 75 people, 60 to 75, yeah. And based on the um, productivity of the forest and land and so on, uh, how much distance do you need between villages? So again, I guess, you know, what a village of 300 people need will be different from village of 75 in terms of food production and gathering, but generally how much geographical distance yeah so um, the geographical distance also um, depends on the nature of the split too so if it, if they're at all out war then they're going to be very far they're going to want to be you know really really far or closer to an outlaw you know a friendly village so on um so you know based on my conversation with my dad is you know one of the one of the um determining factors of of you know distance is is the gardens so, you know, uh, uh, most of their dietary intakes of plantains, and that's where they get most of their food from. And since the Amazonian terrain in that region is in, not very fertile, um, they practice slash and burn horticulture, which fertilizes the ground, but it can only yield, you know, sufficient number of crops for two to three years. And they have to move to a different garden. Um, so that's why the Yanomami are known as semi-nomadic people. And, you know, and, you know, garden placement is, is very important. You know, they have to look at location and, and drainage and so on. So, you know, geographic distances, you know, I've seen villages that are only, you know, about a half hour's walk away, maybe, I'm not really sure how that's in physical distance, I think only several kilometers, but um, uh, then there are others that could be, you know, many, many kilometers away, you know, uh, way up the Orinoco River or much further inland. Um, so I don't think there needs to be a huge geographical distance, but I think a lot of that is dependent on the locations of their gardens. And also, you know, if there's a lot of people in one area, if there's a cluster of villages in one area, the surrounding game tends to become depleted. Yeah. Um, and that brings a good point because a lot of these uh, communities are permanently settled along the river, becoming riparian communities because they want access to, you know, Western goods, uh, merchants, missionary, you know, um, thing, medicines and so on. So, you know, the Amazonian terrain is not suitable for permanent settlement of that kind. So that brings in new kind of issues. Yeah. So, so they'll tend to move based on obviously productivity of land, but how long also do you like their structures last before they start to decay? Yeah. Um, yeah. So they'll, they'll every now and then will replace, you know, it doesn't take much to replace the roof because, uh, they just go out to the forest and collect new leaves and but they're, they're the poles can last many many years you know uh, those the, and the bindings and they um and it's not a very complicated scaffolding system and very easy to repair and um sometimes uh the the thatch roof will get infested with uh cockroaches so okay. you know so if you bump into a pole you, you know you you know a few cockroaches might fall on your head and that can be annoying and so um, also uh, when there's a rainstorm, there could be some leaky holes and, you know, so what the Yanomami do is they'll go out and remove all the old brush, all the old, you know, leaves and replace it with new ones. Um, but they can last for, you know, the structure itself can last for years and years while the roof does need to be replaced. Yeah. Unfortunately, during the dry season, you know, um, the Yanomami, uh, it's it not, it would not be uncommon for an ember from the fire to, you know, cat uh um burn the roof or even the whole shabano so which is sad sometimes but they take it lighthearted so it's okay you know we'll just build a new one <laughs> yeah is there you said it's a small family village um and you're doing the project with your family but is there any of like the young or the kids or like the family is anyone like really more involved or pick up on it more than anyone else? Like, um, yeah, there is. Um, so, uh, let me go back and share this right here. Uh, 
So you can see this picture, slideshow, concurrent slide. Oops. Sorry, I wanted to show you this picture here from the back. You can see uh, this boy in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's my half brother. Um, when I first met him, I walked up to him and <laughs> like a like a typical Westerner, I stuck my hand and I'll say, Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you, right? Like like he knows what I'm doing. <laughs> and I was so nervous. But you know, he said uh, he, he he looked at me and he pointed himself and he said, Ricky, uh, Ricky Martin. So he called himself Ricky Martin. And I was just absolutely stunned. But apparently, you know, um, maybe some doctors had I come up this way and introduced him to Ricky Martin, but he was a very special boy. He, you know, was really, really had a knack for learning how to use various tools and technology and very good with the camera. Um, and he was always, he was a great research partner too. You know, he was really good at, you know, he was very enthusiastic about my research and, and I was, he was trying to, um, he always also wanted to come to the United States. And I was trying to explain to him the process of paperwork and visas and money and just, he just couldn't quite understand. So he said, you know, brother, you must have a very, very big garden uh, in, in where you live. So I'll tell you what, I'll come over, I'll help work your garden. We'll work together and, you know, we'll bring more stuff to the village. So, you know, it was really cute because it's, that was his way of understanding what, you know, like what is hard work, you know? Um, so, and he was a great research partner. But unfortunately, in, in 2019, in December, he was out hunting uh, uh, and he was tracking a peccary, kind of like a wild boar, you know. Um, and unfortunately, it was a freak accident. A large branch had fallen down and crushed his checks, chest, asphyxiated, and he was killed. So, um, it was pretty, a uh, very sad moment in, in my life and for my mother. Um, and, uh, you know, losing Ricky as losing my brother, being someone so close to him was tragic, but, you know, I felt like there's this, this boy had a lot of potential, you know, and I wish really hoped that someday I could have taken him to the, to the United States. So, but anyway, I keep working in his honor and his name and I, you know, and I, he's always there in spirit. Yeah. I had to ask his kids and like young are so curious, especially in situations. <laughs> oh, they are. They are, especially when they see, see things. And, you know, when I write in my journal and they see me make these really designs, they find that so fascinating, you know, that I can make these designs in the book. But not only that I can make these designs, but that these designs have meanings. These words have meanings that I could go back and refer to these designs and still have the same meaning. Um, so yeah, kids loved, you know, and, and in fact, one, I left my journal out once, I guess I was going fishing or whatever. And I came back and there's a kid just <laughs> drew, drew all over my notebook. I'm like, no, that's my precious data. <laughs> you know? Um, so I learned next time to bring a little bit of extra paper or whatever, you know, and teach them. And I remember one time they were uh, looking at my watch and it was like one fifteen, and I said, Hey, what's that? And I would say one fifteen in Spanish. And then it would turn to 116 and they'd say, hey, what's that? And I said, oh, that's 116. So we did that for an hour <laughs> and then and then went to 215 and said, hey, what's that? It's like, no, no, I, I did one whole hour. I'm not going to do the next hour. But they have such patience and curiosity. Yeah, very bright, bright, bright. You know, for a society that never seen this kinds of technology before, really, you know, really were able to pick it up really quickly. Awesome. Learned, questions? Really yeah, well, I have, a, I have kind of a fun question because it's so interesting that your mother went through this cultural experience in New Jersey and now you're sort of going through this cultural experience. And I'm wondering if she has any observations on snow because that was probably <laughs> brand new. And since we're a Canadian chapter, did what was that like for her? Do you have any clue? Yeah. Um, so I have some, we have some footage of my mother, you know, home videos of my mother shoveling snow. She may be the only Yanomami in history to have ever shoveled snow. And she, she thought it was very, she was, I remember looking at the home videos and I remember playing with mom in the snow and it was a lot of fun, but um, you know, that, that brings up an interesting point because a lot of people ask me, how does my mother explain to the village what she experienced? And the response that she usually gives is, you know, she can't, she doesn't. She, how can she explain a car? What frame of, you know, 
you know, if we were to see an alien spaceship that we've never seen before, like we have some frame of mind, like some context, right? How can a Yanomami never experience anything beyond their tropical borders? You know, how could they ever understand what a car is or an airplane? You know, at first she did say like an airplane was a giant bird and it opened up its stomach and it would walk into its stomach and it would fly you away. So something she could, but the snow was like, she, all she could say was like falling sky. And I don't know if like when you're on the river, sometimes there's this um, like foam that you see on the rivers and uh, she, you know, and she can only say it's, it looks similar to that, but she couldn't describe anything you know, else except that it was the sky falling. Yeah. Must sound like a petrifying place to go, New Jersey. Oh yeah, right. Well, you know, my dad, my dad had, had always wanted to, you know, cr have a village in the Amazon, not you know, um, not in Yanomami territory, but a home there so that it can go back and forth, but. You know, I, I understand, you know, when, when you when you have three kids and then you have this, you know, Yanomami wife, it's kind of hard to really, really, you know, how uh, explain to her what's going on, because my mother didn't know why. Why did my father have to go to college and teach all day long for money, for food? Right. So my dad had, was a very different man in the United States than he was in the jungle. He had to go to work, he had to put food on the table, pay the bills and taxes. And how could my mom ever wow. understand that, you know? And, and, you know, as in one story growing up, my dad would tell me is, is the, the concept of police. And, you know, one time my, my dad was pulled over, I guess, I don't know, speeding or whatever. And my mom noticed that my dad was just being so, you know, subservient to this man, you know, and she was angry at us. And why don't you grab your shotgun and, and tell that guy to go away and stop bothering us, you know, and he's trying to explain to her that's not how we do it in society. So my mother saw that as a sign of weakness, because in the jungle, you don't let somebody tell you and boss you around like that. And um, and she would and she she had thought that the police were this like really fierce tribe. So at the end, at night, all the policemen got together and slept under the same roof. And they actually like dressed, they had little children and they would dress them with little uniforms and everything. And so um, the police at is what, what she would call them. So, I mean, to get in the mind of my mother as a Yanomami would be fascinating in what she experiences, yeah. Are, are, is everyone so brave? Like your mom and your dad are super brave. Well, yeah, I mean, this this goes into their character, right? I mean, I guess it takes a very special kind of person like my dad to to do what he did. But it also takes a very special kind of person like my mother to marry <laughs> to marry this alien looking creature, right? <laughs> you know? um, but, you know, when he learned her language and, you know, they developed his friendship and, you know, she really took a liking to him. And, um, and, and I think I think my mom had this sort of this sense of adventure, too, I think, as well. I mean. For her, not only did she marry him, but she also came to the United States. You know, for her, it's like I it's like getting into a time machine and fast forwarding 2000 years. Right. And seeing all these all these things for the first time, horses and, and cars and <laughs> electricity. And um, it, it's so funny. And one one really short story is, you know, the food was different. So it was very hard for her. And my father would play home videos of uh, he would take in the jungle right during their time. But in, in, in New Jersey, he would put them on repeat just so that she had something to watch. And on one of the home videos, she saw uh, um, someone eating a tarantula. And so she had this such deep craving, like she really missed tarantula. It was like hurting her inside. It's like, I really need a tarantula. So my dad didn't know what to do. So he just went to a local pet store and bought a tarantula, you know, to, to feed awesome. to my to feed to my mom you know so my dad tried you know and, and I think we just chalk it up as two radically different cultures it just didn't quite work out you know I think it worked out just the way it was supposed to <laughs> I agree and I think we're you know I'm really excited to hear about Tom and follow your expedition this summer Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Drop me a line. Um, I look forward to meeting the Canadian chapter soon, hopefully in Toronto. And yeah, hopefully we get a chance to see you before you go off. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Please come visit me in the lab. You know, uh, my, um, my uh, fecal, my Yanomami microbiome samples are currently under 
analysis, you know, at the lab, you know, we have great, great personnel, Sarah Van Curen just, you know, did her thesis on the Yanomami microbiome. So, you know, we have some great cutting edge technology. I'm very lucky and honored to be studying at University of Guelph under Dr. M. Allen Verco. So we're going to, we're going to produce some very amazing results. Do we have any other questions or, I mean, I think the questions could go on forever. Um, if you didn't grab David's um, email address or you want any further information or just connect it and you don't have them, just email me. I'm happy to put you all in touch. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank, Thank you, you, David. Thank you, David. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Joe. What are the